What's going on, everybody? It's me, Brian Bauer, back again with a show that I still never came up with a name for because I'm a total idiot. But today we're hanging out with somebody who's actually not an idiot at all, and his name is Rick Galvez slash Malice Divine. And you know what? I'm not maybe the best person to explain it. It is a really cool, somewhat black metal project. I don't know how to explain it. So I'd like to introduce you guys, Rick Galvez. And uh, we were just talking for a couple of minutes and making sure I don't say his name wrong. So what's going on tonight, Rick? Not much, man. You know, just chilling in my room. You know, probably going to work on some music later on, but... Right yeah, on, right cool. on, dude. That's super cool. Anyway, so Rick does a band, like I said, called Malice Divine. And uh, you can check out all that stuff on, uh, uh, like, you know, YouTube and on you know, um, Spotify, all Spotify. those. I'm assuming all the sp- streaming platforms, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Like iTunes as well. I think Deezer as well, but Just, Spotify is definitely up there. I think Spotify is the main one for us. I think I know one person who uses... No, I know no people that use Deezer. Have you ever met a person who uses Deezer? I use Deezer. I think it's more so like a European thing, to be honest. Uh, it, it's got to be because like I've never met anybody yeah. that uses it here. Uh, so in saying that, I've been keeping... I keep kicking around the name Malice Divine. Can you tell us something about your project here? Like you're the, you're the main yeah, guy here, sure. so... Yeah, I'm actually literally the only guy because it's my solo projects. It's my solo, I'd say, uh, melodic black slash death metal project. So definitely a lot of black metal in there, but also, you know, fair amount of death metal, even also a bit of thrash in there too. It's kind of a project where, you know, like I want to, you know, combine different styles, you know, into like, you know, something like I think is pretty unique. So yeah, it's my solo project that I started, uh, that I formed actually back in uh, 2019. That was like when I settled on the name Alice Divine, and I was like putting like the finishing touches to the songs and like getting ready to hit up the studio. So I spent you know a good chunk of 2020 like recording the album, and then just released uh, my debut solo album this year in February actually, and it's been doing pretty damn well ever since. That's super awesome, man. Yeah, I, I heard about Malice Divine um, from Daryl V, who's been on this channel several times. We've had a successful video and stuff. Anyway, uh, he mentioned you. Because obviously, you guys know each other from uh, the Banger TV show, Shredders of Metal, which we'll talk about a little later on. Um, and he said you had this awesome project in Malice Divine. He sent me the... You did a guitar playthrough of one of the songs. I'm sorry I can't remember every song name, but you definitely had a playthrough at one point that I had watched... <laughs> Or playthroughs now, actually. Okay. And he just yeah. sent me one. I was like, hey, this is pretty cool stuff. And what I've noticed with it, it's, it's, while it's a black metal project, it's very much a guitar driven project. Like, if you're like into guitar music, I still think you could listen to this one. You have a lot of solos and stuff. Like, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of uh, guitar solos, a lot of like you know, melodies on guitar, you know even like lots of like classical guitar as well so yeah you're right it's definitely a very uh guitar centric project yeah. and that's what i noticed with it too when i listened to it because not not all black metals like that and it not all of it should be but what i like to boat it in that sense is that it didn't forget that it was still you know a shredder's record that likes black metal and thrash metal and you yeah. still and the classical elements are really cool too so now my question for you is in this case what came first electric guitar or classical guitar i was actually classical like when i started first taking uh, guitar lessons back when i was like 12 years old like i actually started off with uh, nylon string guitar and i was learning how to play you know very basic you know like classical guitar like melodies and stuff like that so yeah i started off really with uh, classical but then I moved over to electric and that was like my main thing, you know, for a long time. It still is, you know, so, but like, I didn't really play like much classical again until like, like four years ago. Just when I, I started doing uh, music at York University, I did a lot of classical guitar playing there. So yeah, about four years ago or so, I got back into um, classical guitar again. And, you know, it was been great, but yeah, classical guitar definitely uh, came first. That's super cool, man. Yeah, um, I've never really played classical guitar, so but what I like that is you actually incorporate it into your that into your record, and there's like a really good flow between those parts 
and the like you know the more aggressive parts of the songs and adds to the ambience of the overall song structures and the overall album too which i think is really cool that you actually do all of that because you know not everybody's as good as at doing that kind of mix of things but this one works really quite well i would say so since the record's been doing so good since uh february when it came out um you must you've been getting quite a few reviews and or at least some ads and stuff and i heard that you recently got one with a decibel magazine i just got my copy uh decibel that they sent me here that has uh, my ad i can show it to you guys he already showed me but i'm getting him to show you anyway <laughs> There you go. Now it's the fun. Facebook, Instagram. I don't see your OnlyFans, though. I don't know what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, uh, YouTube, uh, the Bandcamp link down there, Spotify, Instagram, for fans of as well. So if you like bands like Dissection, Immortal, Duwada, Skeleton Witch, Death. You'll definitely like Malice of Mine, so That's check awful. it out, guys. I actually thought that earlier. I'm like, it definitely does have that dissection kind of vibe to it a little bit with uh, without, like, you know, a totally crazy front dude. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know, no, they, like, murder or anything No, like he's, he, he was definitely... <laughs> what? Uh, there was that, um, uh, what is... If they have a song, it was called The Somber Lane. And, uh, yeah, The Somber Lane. That's such a great song. Oh, man. And they, there's a really good live version of that from Valk in I don't know what year. I think and, it's Valk uh, in 1997. Yeah. I think it was right before I went to prison. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that's, like, after they actually, like, you know, killed the dude and stuff, which is, like... And, like, the show is so, like... It was just awesome when you listen to it and i like that you know a bit of that elements there so i agree with whoever wrote said did you write that or did somebody else write that if you like deception oh, yeah. i created the ad myself oh okay that's yeah, awesome the magazine, so it was all like ads i created myself and you're going to be in decibel again did you say yeah in the october issue because this here is the uh, september issue oh okay. so in october issue it's going to be a never ad plus a review of uh, the album as well. That's that's super cool. So, I mean, if anybody um, is looking for anything, I'm sure, will that be just in the magazine or is like there a website deal with that too? I don't really know how well, Decibel cool. works. I have a website as well, but from what I know, it's just going to be just like featured in the in their magazine. Like that's the actual like this. That's super cool. So now you've done four playthroughs of this stuff. I am not aware, for sure. I've listened to the album on Spotify at least a couple times at this point. Um, you've done playthrough videos, but have you done an actual music video for any of the songs yet? Or are you planning on doing something no, like that? I've done an actual music video for the song, any of the songs. I might consider doing it for maybe the second album. We'll see. You know, I just, I got to see, you know, like how my finances are, you know, with everything is, you know, when you're just like, you know, a solo project, you know, everything is like on you financially. So, yep. That's what I can even afford it by then, you know. We're definitely going to be, you know, a lot more like, you know, playthrough videos and lyric videos as well for like, you know, future songs. But as far as like actual music videos, I like to, you know, for a second album. If it doesn't happen, hopefully the third album, but we'll see, you know, how like, you know, things are doing by then. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, too, it's like a lot of work, especially if you don't have the camera equipment to do this kind of stuff. Then you have to know how to edit the videos and all that stuff. Like, it's yeah, you know, the four uh, playthrough videos I actually I filmed myself. Yep. And then I send like all of um, the um, the footage, like the raw footage, over to the guy who um, filmed and edited my first video for the song in time and he put like all of my raw footage together into uh, you know what you see yeah that's the uh, final result for the uh, playthrough videos the last three that I did at least yeah no and, it, and they looked good too so I mean I do video editing myself and stuff and just realize it's a lot of work especially when you wanted to start doing music videos and then you either got to I mean depending on what you're doing you either have to pay people or find people who want to volunteer and that can be really hard to all line up too. So, except I like doing that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, I live a little too far away from you to help out <laughs> at this point in time. Yeah, I live in, uh, um, Nova Scotia. Right? I'm down Nova Scotia. Have you ever been down here? 
Actually, no, I've never been um, down in Nova Scotia. The farthest east that I've been was like Quebec City, but I've never been more east than that. Oh, wow. Okay. I've never been to Quebec City. I've been to Montreal. I went there to see Iron Maiden back in 2016. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Like, yeah. Maiden are amazing live. Montreal is an, it's a really awesome city, too. Oh, man. It's a super cool city. I loved it. And uh, the, the night I uh, got there, just like way off topic story, but hey, this is why these things are long video half the time usually an hour uh got there went to this bar friend wanted to leave too late already bought a drink uh just got talking to somebody and there was a uh and there was this guy and he had an iron maiden shirt on and he said i said hey i guess i know where you're going tomorrow night he goes iron maiden fan club parties upstairs like the whole meetup and it was a lot of people at that time from labrador Newfoundland, Labrador, and New Brunswick all hanging out because there was nothing else to do. And uh, it was just like zero to 100 in like a second. That city just seemed to move fast for me. And Iron Maiden was just an incredible band live. So that was super cool. So you know what? Speaking of, you know, music, what are some of your musical influences? I don't know if I actually gave you that question, but yeah, I did actually. Um, Good thing you mentioned Iron Maiden because... They definitely like were definitely hands down like one of my biggest earliest influences, and even still to this day, you know, Iron Maiden like has been like a huge influence for me ever since I started getting into music up until now, and probably forever. But definitely like one of my all time favorite bands. So Iron Maiden definitely a huge you know influence on me for sure. Um, other in- early influences for me include bands like you know Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer. Judas Priest, you know, Motorhead. Like, a lot of, like, the classic, like, traditional metal and, and thrash metal was, like, definitely what really got me, like, into metal music. And definitely some of my earliest influences as well. And then not too long after that, I ended up getting into black metal and death metal. So, you know, some other influences include, you know, bands like Bisection, like we were talking about before, yep. you know, like Mayhem, like Dark Throne, Burzum, Emperor. You know, a lot of, like, the classic black metal stuff. And then also, you know, some, like, death metal, too, you know, like, Amon Amar of Children of Odom and old-school death metal, you know, like, Death, Cannibal Corpse, Morbid Angels. So those are definitely, you know, like, my earliest influences. And then, yeah, it, even up until now, yeah, I still consider, like, a lot of those bands to be, like, influences of mine. And, and some newer ones have, you know, kind of up along the way as, like, you know, I got deeper into, into music, you know. Stuff like, you know, like Batane, Sweden, like Skeleton Witch, you know, really good black and thrash band from the States. Um, but also, uh, there's a band, a, a black metal band from the States called Uwada that oh, I really damn. like. Yeah, I've heard a really sick black metal band. Check them out for sure, you know. And, you know, stuff like, you know, Revocation, Obscura, and stuff like that, you know. Definitely, you know, we're, and, and Winter Sun too, you know. Oh, man. And I know Winter Sun and Obscura too. Obscura is great. And, uh, winter winter sun man there's a there's a band my biggest influences yeah for sure no that's a man it's, it's quite a list and like you mentioned like death some of those i listened to a few of those i didn't really know super well i never listened to a ton of cannibal corpse even though i know the band cannibal corpse it's kind of like a household name but i don't really know them and you didn't even mention creator i don't think and they're on your shirt yeah, well, the thing is, for so many bands, like, yeah, Creator is definitely, you know, <laughs> yeah. a huge one. So, and, like, I've heard, you know, like, German thrash bands, you know, like, Sodom and Destruction. There's already so many bands, I'm just realizing that I forgot, you know, like, Bathory, you know, is a huge one. I forgot. Opeth, I forgot. You know, like, so many bands, you know? So, like, it wasn't just Creator that I forgot. Yeah. You know, there was definitely <laughs> yeah. a lot more, I would say usually when somebody asks me so like what what's your favorite band i don't know i can't think of any today <laughs> and uh or it's like what guitar riff you, play some guitar you, so say what it's like where do you even begin there's so oh, many but i know That's at one thing. point there wasn't near as much and now we're in a world like saturated so now speaking of which here's a question i didn't ask but since we're talking about all these bands how how do you go about marketing this these days? 
in a, in a world with so much, so many different bands from like an artist perspective, how do you, how do you go about it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess for me, like I try to find bands that like, I think of bands that are, are fairly similar, at least to like what I'm doing. You know, I've listed, you know, bands like that, in my for bands of, you know, like dissection, immortal yeah. death, you know, and, even like stuff like Behemoth and stuff like that, you know. I never, uh, Behemoth and Immortal are also two like big influences of mine for sure. You know, I forgot to mention that as well. But yeah, you know, I I try to, you know, like, you know, be like, okay, so if you like, you know, these bands, then you'll definitely like what I'm doing too, you know. And also, also really helps, you know, having artwork, you know, for your album that like, you know, like brings to mind, you know, like, you know, different bands and stuff like that. Like I've had people, like a lot of people will actually tell me that uh, the album cover for the Mouse of Vine album really reminds them of like Storm of the Lights band by Dissection, you know, so yeah, that definitely helps, you know. I'd say like, you know, you gotta have a good for fans of and like good artwork and stuff like that and, you know, interviews definitely help for marketing and like advertising. I've done like a lot of like advertising like on Facebook and stuff and reviews definitely help too. That's so awesome. Like there's definitely a lot of ways to go about marketing. Yeah. No, it's just, it's just interesting. I find out to see what people are saying. I like, I like that you mentioned artwork and stuff. Like one of these days I have to like, you know, write an EP or an album or something. It's driving me crazy that I haven't done it. And to me, it's kind of also advice. How do you go about it? How do I stick out? Besides, I mean, I have like the vehicle, like my YouTube channel, but even then it's not that big. It's, it's hard to, you know, get out there and do everything and stuff too. But, you know, so, and I have to open my phone to see where I am at. So now that we've, uh, you know, kind of gone over, you know, that kind of stuff, you wrote a really awesome record, but then what a lot of people, maybe listeners don't think about, but you know players like me who record and stuff i'd like to talk a little bit about your recording writing and recording process so like how maybe like okay when you're writing a song like how, how do you start do you just noodle around do you find something like i do or do you, do you like where do you start with a song oh, idea that's a great for uh songs it definitely like always at least so far like in my music career has always started from like riffs you know Oh yeah, it's always start guitar riff, you know, and then from there I'll have like I'll have other riffs that I think you know would uh, you know would work well, you know, with like a riff I already have, you know, and then from there you slowly you know build together like a a structure of like how you want the song to go, yep, you know, with like and then I'll I'll tab out like the riffs like a guitar pro, just so I can have you know like a good solid idea of like you know how I want the song to go and where I want the song to go and stuff like that. So yeah, it always starts with like the riffs, you know, and like, you know, piecing it together so that, you know, it, you know, if the flow is well, you know, it's smooth, you know, hopefully the song goes somewhere too. And then, you know, after you have like the riffs down, you know, you fill in everything else, you know, like with the drums, the bass. And then I also write the, the lyrics, you know, and I think of like what I'm going to do for like, for my vocals, like what pattern I want my vocals to have and stuff like that. Cause I'm also the vocalist from Alice Fine. Too. Yes. So, um, yeah. And then you just fill in everything else of any of guitar solos. So it really starts with like the riffs or like maybe like an idea I have like a classical guitar, like some songs actually started off like that. And then, you know, I just fill in everything else, you know? Yeah. That's how it works for me. That's pretty cool. Instead of like me, it's like, Oh, it's like I'd be like me here, cool noise. Let's try to do something. It's different. So like a lot of people are using Guitar Pro, and I still don't use Guitar Pro to tap out anything. I'm super lazy. Yeah, I find Guitar Pro to be like an amazing tool for songwriting. Like, and uh, you probably it really process like a lot easier. I find having it. So now my next question is: Do you write your drums in Guitar Pro as well? Yeah, I do. I also write the drums in Guitar Pro. And then, you know, for the album, like, I got uh, Dylan Gallon from that Banger TV to do the session drums. So since he also has Guitar Pro, I sent him over to Guitar Pro Files. He learned, like, songs like, that I already have, like, tapped out. And then 
I have to give him credit too. He also came up with some really awesome fills and even some cool like you know drum drum patterns that he added to some of the songs. So yeah, but just like the drum writing, I'd say it's like ninety five percent what me like writing it. Yeah, um, so I, I know that's what a lot of people are doing is Guitar Pro for that stuff. And I usually just sit there with like whatever drum program I'm using these days is get good drums and I'll just map it out that way when I'm writing something. I just find that's just my workflow with doing things that uh, maybe I should uh, look into doing Guitar Pro and stuff as well. But so like I've never I haven't really used it. So you actually have to click out all your patterns and stuff like for your guitar tablature as well yeah, don't you type in all of the notes and then you can like you know put in like the rhythm you know as well for like how you want the parts to go and stuff like that it's a really you know, great program for songwriting yeah i think i'd be frustrated like pretty quick it's like oh yeah i have to i have to come up the rhythm of the computer i'd be like shit <laughs> and uh, i wouldn't know what to do so when you go to record the music then now uh, there's a whole plethora of ways to record things now we're not just miking amps and stuff anymore and i'm assuming that you're probably recording most of the stuff in the room that i see you in now actually no uh my for recording the album actually i went over to a studio in oshawa ontario called uh, monolithic productions oh sweet with, uh, producer um an engineer uh, named uh, tyler williams so i recorded the album with him over at his home studio in um in oshawa ontario so he engineered it and he mixed it as well at monolithic monolithic productions oh that's super awesome so okay so on your album what amps did you use do you know like did you yeah, get the choice or I want to say about that because we actually originally recorded the electric guitars with uh, neural DSP software. Yep. And then uh, after the whole like uh, recording process for the album was done, we actually reamped <laughs> all of the guitars. And uh, for the rhythm guitars, what we used was we used an EVH 5153 50 watt head. Nice. Going for a uh, Mesa oversized 4x12 cabinet so we we use that as like our, our main like rhythm tone but we also blended um my marshall jvm 210 as well nice. into rhythm tone so the rhythm guitar tone you, you hear is mostly the evh 5153 but with like the marshall jvm like blended into it a little bit underneath it was also with the uh, mesa 4x12 cab so that was a rhythm guitar tone and then for the lead guitars, it was just all like the Mesa 4x12 with the um, Marshall JVM for the lead guitars. And that's, that's like me that you hear on the album. That's super cool. I was actually curious about that because I was I half expecting me like, yeah, I used some plugin or I just did whatever at home. But you used the plugin just to do tracking and then do the reamping and stuff like that, which is really cool. Yeah. Oh, that that's awesome, man. And, uh, and you also obviously recorded um, vocals. Did you do bass as well? Yeah, I played bass on the album as well. For the bass, that actually, from what I know, is like on the album is like uh, neural DSP software. Because you know, with bass, I don't think it's really, from what I've heard, apparently it's not as important to get like you know a sound like from like a plugin or whatever. You know, so as long as you get like the bass frequencies in there, you know, yeah, that's all that matters. But it's still, we still got a really you know killer like bass tone just from like using. Um, neural dsp software you know yeah do you know really well. do you know what one i have dark glass here but there's also one called parallax to be honest with you i can't remember at all like which exact uh, neural dsp base it was but i know i remember it was like it was neural dsp that we used yeah no and they're actor dark class plugins killer I find it awesome. It's easy to use. So that's what I use when I'm here at home. Mind you, I'm not doing near as complicated stuff as uh, you're doing. Like, or, well, reamping is not maybe complicated. I, I like that you guys actually used real amps on the album and stuff too. And uh, because it sounded really, really good. Now, since you're also a vocalist, when did you start learning to scream or like and do that kind of extreme vocals? I'd say that was about, I think about 10 years ago. Because uh, for my first ever band, like, 
that I had back then. I was also the vocalist as well. Like I was, um, you know, guitarist, vocalist, frontman for that. And so yeah, that's when I first started to um, to do vocals. But then I dissolved. I um, you know put that band to rest, you know, for personal reasons back in 2014. And then from then until like um, till just recently, when I started doing Malice of Vine, I didn't really do vocals because, like you know, the bands I was in, you know, I was just a guitar player, so I didn't really have like a reason to like you know practice vocals until like last year when I was you know about to get ready to like you know put like the final vocal ideas down for the songs and get ready to like record the album, you know. So there was definitely you know a lot of years where I didn't even really do vocals, you know. So. I literally just got back into doing vocals like last year. Okay. So like I'm a terrible, I'm not good at vocals and singing and stuff. And I've learned a little bit of breathing and stuff. Like, so what do you do? What did you do to start learning that? That's a good question. I, from what I remember, I like, at least like back in the day when I first started like 10 years ago, I think I just literally just like looked up like on like YouTube, you know, like how to do vocals and stuff like that. You know, it's it's been you know so long since then, so it's really hard to like remember exactly what I did. But yeah, you know, I just try to make sure that like you know I got like enough air like in my diaphragm, so I'm just not relying on my throat. It's really yeah. important having a really good air support so that like you know you don't like kill your vocal cords, you know, and then you can keep going and stuff. But yeah, like that's literally what I started doing again, you know, last year when I, I got started to get back into it. I was doing a lot of breathing exercises, you know, a lot of vocal warm ups. You know, that's really how I got back into it as well. Yeah, no, it's because it sounded good. And uh, it's just, I know a lot of people think that they can get into doing extreme vocals. That'd be the easier thing or something, but I completely disagree. It's totally not. And it takes a lot of work for, I mean, it would take me a ton. I don't think I have the strength to really do that for some reason. I I think it's just more in my head that I can't yeah, do I it. A lot of things are kind of like, it's mostly like a mental thing, but like, yeah, like vocals, they definitely can be very challenging. Especially even like physically. Because I remember when we were recording the vocals for the album last summer, I remember we were doing like like three, four days in a row, I think, to start off with. And then, oh man, like, because I wasn't used to doing vocals like that much, like mm. every day for like numerous days in a row. Oh my God, it was so draining, you know, like, not even just like for my vocal cords, but even just, like, you know, like mentally. Oh yeah. So, like so much immersion, so much focus. You know, I had to, like, take, like, a couple of days off. Actually, I think uh, I ended up taking, like, about a week or two off, and then I went back into it because I was just so, like, drained. Yeah. You know, from doing, like, you know, like must have been, like, six, seven-hour sessions, you know, like, a couple days in a row. You know, it was, it was intense. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I think I, I was watching, like, the Amon and Marth documentary, and they were saying, like, they had – I forget – what's his – what is the guy's name from Amon and Marth? I can't remember. <laughs> We'll say what what johan uh, yeah yo yeah, yeah johan you cut out a little bit there thanks zoom zoom's doing awesome tonight but uh either way yeah i think they would give him like three days and they'd be like okay you need a day off before you go back and do the rest of that stuff too but yeah no yeah. You, you you do it all on those records man it's it's crazy have you guys played have you played live yet with mouse divine no i haven't you know, it's kind of hard to see with the pandemic yeah. and like in my area right now we have a like local shows coming back but like it's all seated limited capacity and to be completely honest i don't want to like you know play live under those circumstances no i don't blame you at all be able to you know have people be able to like mosh headbang to my music because it's the kind of music that's like perfect for that oh you yeah and like you know so you don't you don't want to be if things go well like it'll be hopefully mouse to buy shows in 2022 that'd be pretty cool yeah you don't want people sitting there with their cup of tea like oh this is such a quite a band <laughs> you know really performing live under those circumstances like i think i'd feel pretty awkward about that Sweet. yeah it would be it would actually be pretty strange sitting there doing that mind you there's people that are doing that in whatever genre i've got tickets to see sabaton and judas priest and 
man, I hope that it's going to be like, I'm going to, I'm in the seats this time for that one. I've seen them up front a couple times. I'm hoping that it's going to be like, you know, a legit rock show, especially with Sabaton. I've never seen them live. Have you? Yeah, actually I have. Um, I'm really not a Sabaton fan at all, but I did see them live once just because they were uh, playing with Amata Marth and Skeleton Witch. Nice. So, you know, so I'm on a Mara Skeleton Witch, two bands that I definitely like. And like Sabaton was like in the middle of them, you know, like the only band of the three that I wasn't really a fan of. So that was like the only time like I saw like Sabaton live. Just because they were also playing with uh, bands that I'm a much bigger fan of. Oh, yeah. 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 Really. What's the best show you think you've ever seen since we're on the top of the concerts? Oh, man. Um, honestly, I don't know. You know, there's definitely like a lot of really good shows that I've seen. You know, like the last time I saw Behemoth in 2018, you know, that was, you know, a fucking amazing show. Every single time I've seen Creator, you know, they fucking killed it. You know, like Creator is an amazing live band. You know, so I can't wait to see those guys again, you know, whenever. Um, also, since we're talking about Iron Maiden before, like pretty much like every time I've seen Iron Maiden has been like, you know, an amazing show. That, There's so many good shows I've seen. It's really hard to like, you know, pinpoint you know, like one that's like the best show ever. Yeah. You know? I I can tell you one thing. I've never seen Creator, but I will tell you one thing. With Iron Maiden. I was exhausted at that show in Montreal. I've never had a band wake me up quite like Iron Maiden did. It was just it was insane. I yeah, that's a sign of like a really good live band. You know, like you could be like feeling like you know kind of tired for like whatever reason. And then, like, you know, when they're playing, your just energy just, like, you know, soars um, again. Oh, man, it's just, I don't know, man. It's just so good. I don't know how to explain it. The opening act was, like, the Raven Age. They were, eh. It sucks because Anthrax was playing shows right up till I think, that point with them. And then it was the Raven Age. It's like, oh, fuck. I think uh, that's um, once when they had the Raven Age, like, opening from yeah. When I saw them in 2017, they actually had ghosts opening for them. That was nice. really cool. Oh, that would have been awesome. awesome. Like, I'd say, like, ghosts are definitely out there as far as, like, some of, like, the best shows I've seen. Because, you know, like, their stage set up, you know, and, like, just the atmosphere for shows. And I just think they have, like, really catchy songs, too. So, yeah, I'd say ghosts are definitely out there as, as far as, like, some of the best shows I've seen. Man, there was this band I saw once. I don't know. They were just killer. They were a Japanese black metal band called Ethereal Sin. I saw them play in... Yeah, I saw them play in Seoul. And I don't know how to... I mean, it was like... It was black metal for sure. But man, they... I don't know. They just put on such a killer show. I was was living in Korea at one point. And uh, I would go to the shows. And one of the last shows I saw there happened to be a mix of Korean and Japanese bands. And one of the bands was ethereal sin. Uh, somewhere some, somewhere I got a picture of me and a few guys with that band and they're, they were really cool guys. Um, I don't know if they're even a thing anymore, but man, they were freaking cool. And, um, speaking of which, because I'm obviously really into guitars and stuff. And most of my channels based around guitars. If you've watched any of it or heaven, either way, it's kind of like Daryl, me and him are really into the talking about guitars and stuff. The one guy yeah, had an, so- very guitar centric um you know content yeah he uh, anyway this guy had a, an esp sv which is a model of it's like it's like a Rhodes. it was kind of like how do i explain it maybe not like quite like the Rhodes. it was like more like the, the alexi leho kind of model but with a neck pickup okay and uh, because the Lexi Leho model, I don't, I'm not an ESP expert by any means, so I'm not gonna pretend I know what I'm talking about. But they were made like I think they were only for the European and Japanese market, and it was like holy crap, that guitar is friggin' cool. So speaking of guitars, now that we're uh, now that we're there, I'm just gonna completely segue us into that. What like what are you playing for guitars these days? I believe you're a Jackson guy. Yeah, I am a Jackson guy. Like you know. Some of my favorites definitely include uh, my two Jackson Dinkies. I was actually just looking over to my right just because, uh, you know, my Jackson Dinky is over there. I actually can go grab it. Actually. Yeah, go for it. So this is actually the uh, Jackson Dinky that I played on my debut album for Mouse Divine. Sweet. I recently got um, 
Seymour Duncan uh, Black Winter pickups installed a couple of months ago. But other, other than that, you know, it's still exactly the same as it was, you know, as I got it. That's good. It's yeah. uh, currently, it will be, you know, like two and two uh, D standard. Yep. That's what I use uh, for mouse of mine. Nice. So, yeah, this is probably like my, uh, has been my main guitar for a while. It's a uh, really cool charcoal gray Jackson Dink. Yeah, yeah, I really so, like that. How old is it? I got this um, November 2019, so uh, pretty close to uh, having had it for like two years now. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, Floyd Rose, what Floyd Rose is on it? Yeah, it's a Floyd Rose. Um, I don't know like what exact Floyd Rose is. No, it's a Floyd Rose. It has uh, ebony fretboard, you know. Nice. Bring it up the moments, you know. 10 to 52 gauge because I find that's a really good gauge for uh, D standard. For D standard, absolutely is. Yeah. Uh, man, Jackson's are, oh man, it's good. I'm actually, I've got Charvel gas like really bad these days. So I played a pro mod once. I'm like, oh, it's so good. I would, yeah, Charvel. Well, I think I might have played one. Like, I think, um, I think my old guitar teacher from like, you know, like 15 years ago, I think, had one. I think I played that. But other than that, I don't think I really played a sharp album. So I go put this back. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Nah, man, I like the, uh, you know, the Charvel Jacks and stuff. I have a Jackson here as well. I should uh, show you in a minute while we're here. So what's uh, the Jackson Dinky uh, back in uh, February actually around the time my album came out. This is the, uh, you know, pretty much all white, you know, maple fretboard Jackson. Nice. Still has um, Seaboard Duncan uh, pickups. Yeah. Guys, JB. Something- yeah, JB. JB I just wanted Jazz. to get something similar to like my other Jackson, you know, just for like you know, for when I play live eventually for Mouse to Vine. Yep. You know, something similar, but also like, a little bit different. You know, like has the maple fretboard, this one, and you know, very different color. You know, still a really great guitar. Electric wow. strings, and it could be two gauge as well. Yep. Yeah. Do you always just play in D standard or do you play any other tunings? Uh, no, Actually, I had the Ibanez over here, an Ibanez RG that I bought off a friend of mine uh, last November, I believe it was. This is my uh, super scrap that I have that I keep in E standard, you know, whenever I want to like learn anything that's like standard tuning. Okay. Like this, you know, I was actually um, trying to learn some, uh, some Marty Friedman stuff, you know, from his Megadeth days, you know, on this. So. This guitar is, you know, great for that because, you know, you standard tuning. I really like this guitar as well, actually. Man. Really nice guitar. That, yeah, I know. They're, they're really cool. The Jackson feel and Ibanez feel like fine can be a little bit different, but they're somewhat similar, too. They're still super strats made for, you know, shredding and playing metal, so. Um, yeah, exactly. Like, super strat is, like, my favorite, like, shape now. It's because of, like, how comfortable it is, you know? Like, you, you rest it, you know, while shutting yep. down and just sits, you know, bend your body so perfectly. Like I used to play a lot of like more extravagant shapes, you know, like V's and Kelly's and stuff like that. Yeah. And you know, like after you know, after playing that for so long, I even you like put like a super strat on. You know, it's like, man, I didn't realize how like uncomfortable it actually was to play like Kelly's and, and stuff like that. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, like, I'm all about the super strats just because of how comfortable they are. Yeah, no, I like I like the uh, super strats too. I'm pretty sure that's I have one less Paul shape. That's it, and it's yeah, cheap. I'm not really a fan of the less Paul shape. I don't know. It just never really did much for me, to be honest. Yeah, and everything else. I think it's because I started off with a PV Raptor. Do you remember what you had for a first guitar? My first ever guitar was actually a um, a Yamaha classical. Okay, and what was your first electric? But I just, you know, smaller shape because now I was like 12 back then. Yeah. You know, but that's was my first ever guitar. And also my first ever electric guitar, actually I still have, is right here. It's uh, my uh, Thunder Stratocaster. I showed my thing to you as well. This is my first ever electric guitar. Nice. This, uh, oh, man. I, it's... This one, I think it was like either 12 or 13, you know. This one is also an E-standard as well. Nice. So this is my the ones I keep in use standard. Yeah, and you probably got used to not hitting the volume knob because that's one thing that drives me crazy with the Stratocaster is where the volume knob is placed. I know, like so close. To, like, I know. The 
it's because Leo Fender, I don't think was actually a guitar player. He just, he could design guitars. But yeah. it's, it's those little things where the Jacksons, they're always like out of the way. Yeah, for sure. But it's still a really nice guitar, you know? Oh, I hell yeah. Some- yeah, man. So you can't, re- you know, it's hard to kind of beat a Strat. I mean, imagine, like, he made a, a design of a guitar that just never really ever went away. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah, just... It's cool, you know, if anything, you know, just, you know, there's been improvements to it, and, you know, it's just it's still as popular as ever, I find yeah exactly and there's like a billion different versions of the things too yeah i got well the jackson i have here is not mine it's going to uh kevin who uh let me review it which is cool but we're gonna be shooting some videos and doing a podcast the first one in person here another little over a week or so we're doing one of these too so you can get his guitar back but it was fun to play with an old 1994 jackson stealth and uh I sh- i'll show it to you quickly if you want what's one second sure since we're talking about Jacksons and stuff, here is the it is a 1994 Jackson Stealth made in Japan. So it's got the professional. Oh, nice. yeah, sick. And yeah, and it's got the uh, it's got a it's got a Floyd Rose. It's like a Jackson Floyd Rose, if you know what I mean. Like it just says Jackson on it. It uh it holds tuning and stuff incredibly well. It's pretty cool. And it's got the uh, output jack like here, like an Ibanez S series. I don't know I if you know. Say what. Say what? What pickups do you have on that? They're just Jackson stock pickups. Oh, Jackson stock pickups, yeah. Yeah. The Jackson Kelly that I had you know, for a couple of years, um, that's pretty much all I had on it was just the stock Jackson pickups. And then yeah. I sold it to a friend of mine if any put in some like EMGs into it after he bought it off me. Yeah, anyway, that's the Jackson that's here that I've been playing with. But I've played like the RR models and stuff like that too. But I'm not as familiar with Jackson as I am like Ibanez's and stuff. It's like I find some people that are really into the hat or they got the Ibanez's and stuff. You seem to like both of them. Some people hate the Ibanez's and love the Jacksons. So I really like both. I, you know, I think uh, both Ibanez and Jackson are fantastic brands. Yeah. Yeah, like I'm definitely a bit more of the Jackson guy, but you know. Ibanez is still killer as well. Oh hell yeah! I mean, they all have like their ups and downs too. Like there, there's some models that you know or whatever. But like, man, some of the Jacksons are some of the nicest things you can play too. So, depending on uh, what it is that you're playing, and it's all about how you get them set up as well. So yeah, exactly. that's that's half of it. Now, speaking of guitars and guitar playing and super strats and all this shredding and stuff, you were on a banger TV show called Shredders of Metal. In fact, you're the third guy that's had something to do with banger TV on my channel. Yeah, I was on that actually uh, two years in a row. I was. Uh, oh wow! Season one and then season two as well. I didn't realize you were on season two. I think I've only ever watched season one. I know I'm lazy with watching guitar players. Yeah, so. Season one was way better, so you're not really missing out on much. Yeah. No, it's been it's been a little while. It's been a little while. I watched it again since I did the videos with uh, Daryl. But I remember starting to watch that back then. Of course, I didn't know who any of you guys were when I originally watched that three years ago. I was like. I didn't know who Daryl was. I ended up meeting Daryl through the old Anglin Discord and stuff. And it's like, and people were like, when we started, we started working on things. It's like, who's? It's like I recognize that guy. Where's he from? And it's like he was on a banger TV show. And they're like, that's where I've seen him and stuff. It's like okay, and uh, yeah. So I watched, I watched that show, and like overall, it was just like. Uh, watching it, I it was weird because like I see a lot of you guys that you get up there. And it just felt like they gave you guys some like tone or something. And just things just didn't always feel like it was working out. I don't know if that's a way to weed people out or what. Yeah, that's the thing. Like a lot of people like were like, at least online, were like bitching about like how bad the guitar tone apparently was. And yeah, I, I think it wasn't, you know, a very ideal tone to play with like at all. But, you know, hey, it is what it is, you know. I still thought it was a really fun experience. You oh, know, hell even yeah. Though it was, scary as hell but like you know we're still you know, a fun time yeah i'm still you know like happy i was part of that yeah you so I, the first season i watched was the, with alex Golnick, and you guys didn't know who it was going to be him when you went in there did you no no like no judges were like you know like me like no like prior 
Well, actually, um, it was known as Sam Dunn and I think Daniel Decay were going to be judges. But I remember they, they said that there was like going to be like a celebrity judge, you know, that we would, you know, discover who it is, you know, like the day of. And yeah. then being Alex. And then, and how does it feel when it's Alex Skolnick? Is it excitement or nervousness? I think for like pretty much all of us, it was like definitely nervousness. I remember even like uh, one of the contestants, uh, Alex Zubair. Okay. He was saying like, you know, like Testament is like his favorite band. <laughs> and like when he when it was you know found out that like Alex Skolnick was like the you know one of the uh, judges, you know he was like freaking. Out. I remember he was like dripping with like sweat and stuff oh, yeah. like that he was nervous. <laughs> oh know, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it was a good. One. He's a beast player, but there's one weird thing I found when I watched one of those episodes of it, and I can still remember hearing the DI track. I'm like, why is like I, maybe I'm crazy, but I swear I heard the DI track in the like production video. I'm like, why? Why is the, the DI? I'm pretty sure I could hear the DI track at one point. I'm like, why do I hear the DI track? Maybe I'm just That's insane. So maybe I just maybe I'm just thinking maybe i'm just yeah. thinking that up but i swear i just heard like i heard like the tone and the di track i'm like huh like what is happening here like i mean you know i i got you guys all prove that you're like amazing players but like when i watch it i'm like it just reminded me of me when i go into somewheres every so often it's like you start playing it's just like man this is not working for me today <laughs> or i'm playing like the worst idea and like there was a few people i mean, really struggled with that too i'm like i don't f i feel like as much as i should feel bad how good these guys are i kind of feel better about myself <laughs> because it's like i feel like everybody's portrayed as a human being here it was honest in that sense and i like that because i find a lot of the internet yeah, isn't that honest you know, you know authentic you know it goes to sh it was just you know just typical human beings, you know, put into a situation that's, you know, very, you know, stressful, you know, under conditions that aren't, you know, the most ideal. And then they just have to, you know, just do what they can, you know, regardless, you know, that what happens happens. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, like, like, I think, you know, it could have been better, you know, I think for a lot of us, you know, but, um, Hey, you know, I just have no regrets about doing that. No, the experience itself would be like something you never really forget, you know. It's just one of those. Yeah, it's even just being able to, just, you know, like just be a part of something like that, you know, it was just like really cool. You know what I mean? Yeah, hell yeah. Somebody asked me, why didn't you do it? One, I didn't hear about it. Two, it's in Toronto. It's a lot of flying to go up and uh, get my ass handed to me. <laughs> so either way, if I was in the area, it'd be cool if I knew about something like that. But I mean, I mean, every, almost everybody on that show, I would say it was like when I watched it, like they all had some good talent and stuff. I could tell that's for sure. Obviously like Frankie, I mean, he was really good. I don't know anything about what he does, but uh, outside of that show, maybe Vesperia. I forget if that's the band he's I in. I played Vesperia actually with um, Dylan, who um, is you know a host for Banger TV and who also yeah. like played for on my album. So yeah, he um, he's a good lead guitarist for uh, Vesperia. And then I, th I know he released like a solo EP. I think like about two years ago. Okay. So, yeah, but yeah, he's a killer musician. Yeah. You know? Actually. Um, Remember two years ago, actually, I took some lessons from him for about like two months or so. No, oh, that's you know, really and cool. it was, yeah, it was a great experience. You know, he really helped me out and stuff. And I think you know, I got like even better. You know, yeah. as a result, of taking lessons from him because yeah, he's a fucking amazing guitar player for sure. Oh, oh hell yeah! <laughs> but yeah, no. It's it was it was cool though like actually funny seemed to be meeting everybody from banger tv these days other than sam dunn i've never met daniel decay i've talked to dylan a few times on instagram and uh very nice guy uh go always, i always had a good impression from him i don't i mean we don't really know each other i covered one of his dad's songs though in the form of metal which is pretty cool yeah his, his, uh, his dad's the singer of uh sticks which is oh you yeah know, pretty damn you know, like a famous dad. Yeah, actually, you know? well, uh, he had his own solo project too, which was just like, you know, Lawrence Gowan. And uh, he had a song called Moonlight Desires. And uh, we did like a, a cover of 
Moonlight Desires. I have it on my YouTube channel. I should just link it below just so people can see it. Got my friend uh, yeah. Valerie to sing on it too. It was something I did as a joke one day like by myself. And then one day it's like, wait, I could actually do I something with this. I definitely like to check it out. Yeah, I, I'll do that afterwards. I'll put the link in below for everybody else. But yeah, like sh- Shredders of Metal is like... It would be man. It was it was an interesting show to watch, that's for sure. And I definitely know that I would be humbled big time if I went up there and had to play with like you, Daryl, and all these guys. It was like, holy crap! Some of you guys can like out shred the hell out of me. And I mean, I can play. I can somewhat hold my own. But you know, when you start, I've had experiences where I've played with people too, or played with somebody. It's just like, man, this dude is amazing. So. We're coming around to the end of this, you know, video and stuff too. So, so what's next for Malice Define? I know you kind of mentioned other albums, but what do you uh, what do you foresee in the like the near future? Yeah, that's a great question. Like, yeah, definitely another album. I've been working on album number two actually for a couple of months now, and you know, a lot of progress has been made this year for sure on album number two. You know, but. A shit ton of work, though, you know, because it's like it, oh, yeah. it's a solo process, you know. And since you know it's so busy musically, you know, like yeah, it's definitely you know the kind of thing that takes a while. You know, I'm hoping to be able to start recording it early next year, like sometime in early 2020. I'd really like to start recording it so I can have it out. You know, maybe sometime in the later part of next year. Yeah, because you know I already got some good momentum going just from the first album. You know, yeah, I really like to keep momentum going you know into 2022 and beyond but yeah like definitely you know a second album and then you know gonna be you know a lot more albums after that and then other than that like i definitely want to start playing live with mouse divine like hopefully sometime in 2022 we'll see you know if like the the pandemic is like completely over by then like because even though like shows are starting to come back like i don't think like the pandemic is like officially over yet no, I don't. I I don't think it's never it's never really over till it's over in the whole world. But we're we're not talking about that today. Um, either way, but I understand exactly what you're saying, and you want to be able to you know give the fans the show that they deserve. Yeah, exactly. You know, and like I want to make sure about like you know the live lineup that I get together. You know, it's like you know tight as possible. Exactly. So we can deliver you know a killer show, but you know have the people you know, have a great time you know seeing us live and stuff yeah you know, no, so. exactly that'd be super cool so uh, man thank you so much rick for doing this today yeah no worries at all man it was great you know we had some uh, good discussions here today yeah exactly i mean i didn't wing it as bad this time ever so often i wing it i still wing it halfway through anyway saying that everybody should check out the band his band malice divine the links are going to be below to spotify and all that stuff and um, congrats for getting into decibel magazine and stuff you guys can all check that out come up here soon whether it's you see this before or after the fact either way so that's going to be out and uh you have a youtube channel for malice divine as well right with your playthroughs yeah exactly it's about being on malice divine to the youtube search bar and then you know I'll pop up there don't worry we'll link it below too so if you're watching it here and you made it this far in the video you can definitely check all that stuff out and so you can also so you can click the subscribe button and you're on Bandcamp too right yeah Bandcamp. you know i'm glad you mentioned that because we have physical copies for sale the physical copies of the album for sale as well as two t-shirt designs and also hoodies as well so it's getting it's gonna be winter time soon over to band camp you know buy something because you know that would be of great help to me and be immensely appreciated awesome yeah and remember winter time's coming soon fall and you need a really cool hoodie to do all those cool fall activities like we need to keep it warm and comfortable you know so exactly where Buy something. Wear it Thanksgiving dinner with your family and all that kind of fun stuff, you know. So they can ask about the shirt. You're like, this is a cool band. So cool, you may never have even heard of them before. And uh, grandma. <laughs> anyway, so guys, yeah. thank you so much for doing this. And then thanks for our, thanks to everybody for watching is what I should say. Look at me stumble over words. So thanks, Rick, for doing this today. Everybody can check out Malice Divine, buy a hoodie. Um, you can also, uh, you know, click the subscribe button here. See, this is YouTube, so I have to go over 
over all the generic YouTube stuff like clicking the like button, the subscribe button, the notification bell, leave a comment below and all that kind of fun stuff. And I'll see you guys all in the next video. All right. So I guess we'll peace out from there. All right. See you.